Good evening, everybody. Welcome to JWA's Quarantinish Book Talks. I'm Judith Rosenbaum of the Jewish Women's Archive. I'm so happy to be back here with you tonight. If you are new to JWA and to our Quarantine Book Talks, thank you for joining us tonight. If you've been with us over this past more than a year of weekly programs, welcome back. We are so glad to have you with us. Uh, please, as always, introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, make sure to chat to panelists and attendees so we can all see your comments. And of course, we'll want you to be adding questions there uh, for during our conversation as well. As many of you know, JWA is a digital archive that expands the Jewish narrative by documenting and sharing Jewish women's stories. Our framework is history, but we go beyond what many people think of as history and love to explore all of the creative ways that Jewish women make meaning of the past, present, and future, including poetry, which will be our focus tonight. The Quarantinish Book Talks are just one aspect of JWA, and I hope that you will check out jwa.org to explore the full range of our work. Tonight, we have a very special program, a conversation with three poets in honor of National Poetry Month. Uh, we will get to hear some of their poetry and also have the opportunity to talk with them about their work and their creative process. As always, we welcome your questions, so please add those in the chat. And I will introduce our panelists for the evening. Joy Layden is the Gottesman Chair in English at Yeshiva University. She has published nine books of poetry, including The Book of Anna, recently reissued by Ioa Press, uh, a memoir of gender transition, the National Jewish Book Award finalist through the Door of Life, and Lambda Literary, Literary and Triangle Award finalist, The Soul of the Stranger, Reading God and Torah from a Transgender Perspective. Episodes of Joy's online conversation series containing multitudes are available at jewishlive.org slash multitudes. And I'll just say we love Jewish Live. They're a partner with us on the Quarantine Book Talks. You can also find Joy's writing um, at her website, joyladen.wordpress.com. Uh, from Jamaica and born to a Jamaican father and Venezuelan mother is Shara McCallum. She's the author of six books published in the U.S. and U.K., including No Ruined Stone. La Historia es un Cuarto, History is a Room, an anthology of poems selected from across her six books and translated into Spanish by Adalbert Salas Hernandez, will be published in 2021 by Mantis Editorias in Mexico. McCallum is on the faculty of the Pacific Low Residency MFA and is a professor of English at Penn State University. She was recently appointed the 2021-22 Penn State Laureate. And last but not least, Liz Leah Newman has created 75 books for readers of all ages, including a pair of memoirs in verse entitled I Carry My Mother and I Wish My Father, uh, the verse novel October Morning, A Song for Matthew Shepard, and the children's books Gittel's Journey and Ellis Island Story, Quetzal, the Cat Who Composed, and Welcoming Elijah, a Passover Tale with a Tale, which just recently won a National Jewish Book Award. She has received poetry fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Massachusetts Artists Foundation, and from 2008 to 2010, she served as the Poet Laureate of Northampton, Massachusetts. Welcome to all of you. So very glad to have you with us tonight. So um, we're going to begin this evening and get into the poetry spirit and help to get to know all of you by beginning with some reading. And we're gonna start with Joy. Thank you. I am delighted to be here um, and honored uh, to be with Shara and Leslie. I'm gonna be reading from uh, the Book of Anna, which Leslie kindly held up. Um, and uh, the Book of Anna is written in the voice of a fictional Holocaust survivor named Anna Asher, uh, who is living in 1950s Prague. She spent her adolescence in a concentration camp and she um, has uh, uh, numerous problems, including um, engaging in risky and compulsive sexual behavior. And uh, the one person that she has a, something like a friendship with has given her a referral to a psychotherapist named Dr. Solomon. And um, Anna, who uh, the, in the book is composed of diary entries and poems. The diary entries are in the present and they reflect on the process of writing the poems. And in the poems, Anna is trying to figure out how to understand what she's gone through and whether it's possible to live with it. So uh, she does that always by taking a material from uh, Jewish sacred texts and forcing it to serve her story. So 
uh, her friend tells her to have psychotherapy with Dr. Solomon and she is like, oh, the Song of Songs. So this poem is called, that she writes is called uh, Song of Songs, Eight Sessions with Dr. Solomon. And each of the sessions uses language from the corresponding chapter of the Song of Songs. Um, in uh, Song of Songs, she's focusing on the three women the, uh, who designated her as a, their survivor. So they gave their lives for her and uh, they all perished and she didn't. This is the first session. Yes, doctor, the same dream. The harem, bags of myrrh between their breasts, henna tattoos on their wrists. The terminally noble daughters of Barracks 10 who made the suicide pact to husband me as their, their vineyard doctor, their designated fruit, the shoot they'd plant beyond the camps. He must be here, they murmur. His scent is growing stronger. The Rebitson trembles like a veil. The physicist giggles. The whore straightens her hem. It's a tense moment, doctor. God returning to the harem to kiss us with the kisses of his mouth, stud us with gold, shower us with silver, lay us on couches of leaves between panels of cypresses. The Rebitson was right. The whore was a dangerous influence. The others shunned her. With me, she could reminisce. Soft Jewish boys, firemen, lawyers, grandfathers with whiskey on their breath. It was a living doctor. No guns, no boots, just small dark rooms, need and nakedness. After every tete-a-tete, the Rebitson would murmur supplications to shield me. She was serious, doctor, from growing up like that. One second, let's see if I can, the microphone will help. I can, hear, I can hear you well. I'm not having a problem with the sound. Is this better? Is that okay? That sounded good. It sounded good before too. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Is this too much for a first session, doctor? You're looking a little pale. Your predecessor accused me of using his office to violate the dead. He was no Solomon, doctor. It isn't that easy to violate daughters of Barracks 10. In your professional opinion, doctor, what do I owe them? For the physicist, a skeptical smile? Kinder for the Rebitson? For the whore, a steady job and steadier diet of men? And for the king whose name is like perfume, unspeakably intimate, who has brought me to your couch to recount what the Rebitson called his merciful deliverance? Where was I, doctor? Oh, yes. The dream, the harem, myrrh, the footfalls of his nibs. I take my place between whore and Rebitson, blink and have no lids. My jaws keep moving. The chant goes on, but my mouth is full of flesh. I'm eating my way across a face familiar immense. I have no hands, no skin, hidden wings, a sweet tooth for the dead. A scarab beetle, yes, uncanny doctor, a truly inspired guess. Black but comely, part Rebitson, part whore, consummate physicist, a living tribute doctor to the daughters of Barracks 10. Return, isn't that what you call it? Return on their investment. How can you hide from what never goes away? No, doctor, not Heraclitus. I'm quoting the Rebitson. The physicist loved to needle her in the dark after last inspection. God this, God that, sotto voce blasphemies that had us all in stitches. Usually the Rebitson obliged by begging heaven to forgive a soul made foolish by torment. The whore would snicker, quick, or he'll sentence her to a concentration camp. The physicist snort as though some theorem had just been demonstrated. This time, the Rebitson rattled them. How can you hide from what never goes away, she asked. That's the question, isn't it, doctor, in the harem of the dead, where a god whose love is stronger than wine and kinkier than the Rebitson admitted sniffs among his women, 
selecting me for scarabs chitons, the daughters of barracks ten to hold his favorite poses, love, sacrifice, forgiveness. Tell me, you whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou restest by flocks at noon. I eat my way from temple to temple. The king leans back on the bed. My jaws tire of opening and closing. Moonlight glints on my carapace. Thank you. And um, I'm so sorry, but I have a family emergency, so I'm gonna have to say good night. Um, but thank you all and have a wonderful time. Thank you for being with us, Joy, even just for this little bit to be able to hear your work is it's so beautiful and such a gift to us. Thank you. Good night. Good night. We're going to move on to Shara. There's so much to talk about that I and I think we'll speak across the poems and we'll we'll get to that once we've heard from everyone. Thank you, Judith. Um, it's as Joy just said, it was wonderful to get to hear her read. And I'm grateful to be here with Leslie in conversation with you as well for inviting me, Judith. Um, I'm going to just read two poems. I'm not going to give too much of the summary. I'll just let them be in the air and then we can talk. Uh, Leslie, you made me change my mind. I'm reading the first uh, poem from Mad Woman, Memory. I bruise the way the most secreted, most tender part of a thigh exposed, purples, then blues. No spit shine shoes, I'm dirt. You can't wash from your feet. Wherever you go, know I'm the wind, accosting the trees, the howling night of your sea. Try to leave me, I'll pin you between a rock and a hard place. We'll hunt you even as you erase your tracks with the tail ends of your skirt. You think I'm gristle, begging to be chewed? No, my love, I'm bone. Rather the sound bone makes when it snaps. That ditty lingering in you like ruin. And I'll read one more poem, which is the last poem in the forthcoming book. No Ruined Stone, there's a poem that opens and closes the book that is, uh, carries the same title as the title of the collection. When the dead return, they will come to you in dream. And in waking will be the bird knocking, knocking against glass, seeking a way in. Will masquerade as the wind, its voice made audible by the tongues of leaves greedily lapping as the waves self-made few is a turning and returning. The dead will not then nor ever again desert you. Their rest will be the coat cloaking you. The farther you journey from them, the more distance will maw in you time and place gulching when the dead return to demand accounting, wanting and wanting and wanting everything you have to give and nothing will quench or unhunger them as they take all you make as offering, then tell you to begin again. Thank you. Thank you, Shara. So I'm going to read uh, just very briefly from my paired um, memoirs in verse. I carry my mother and I wish my father. Um, like many women, I became the caretakers of both my parents in turn at the end of their lives, which was a real honor. Um, and so the book I carry my mother begins with my mother's diagnosis and ends uh, at her first yard site. So I'll just read a little bit through so um, you'll hear a little bit about what that journey was like. The deal. 
My mother's doctor tells me here's the deal. She's got six months to live a year at most. His words lodge in my gut a heavy meal. My mother's doctor tells me here's the deal. I'm very sorry, I know how you feel. But keep your chin up, don't give up the ghost. My mother's doctor tells me here's the deal. She's got six months to live a year at most. And then uh, this poem has a refrain that I heard all my life and I'm going to guess it's familiar to many of you. The title is A Daughter's A Daughter. My mother declares in her hospital room that my fate was decided deep down in her womb. A son is a son until he takes a wife, a daughter's a daughter for all of her life. She's telling me I am in charge of her fate while both of my brothers are deemed second rate. As she's born unto death, I will be her midwife, a daughter's a daughter for all of her life. I argue, I reason, I try as I might. I learn from the best how to put up a fight. My mother and I are no strangers to strife, a daughter's a daughter for all of her life. The papers are signed, I'm to do as she said. If she cannot be cured, she would rather be dead. Can I cut the cord of her life with a knife? A daughter's a daughter for all of her life. So as you can probably hear, these poems are all in form. They're all lyric poems. And this poem actually is an imitation of a poem written in the 15th century by Sir Philip Sidney. It's called, My Mother Has My Heart. My mother has my heart and I have hers. We traded on the day that she gave birth. Each passing year, the line between us blurs until the day I lay her in the earth. My heart in her now cracked and split in two. Her heart in me now wound down like a clock. As she and I turn into something new, the love between us hardens into rock. My heart in her, a newborn morning dove, still safely tucked inside its sheltered nest. Her heart in me, a letter signed with love, a treasure I keep deep within my chest. From this day forth, whatever else occurs, my mother has my heart and I have hers. And this is a very short poem. It's only 16 words and it's an imitation of a, one of my favorite poems in the world called Proximity by Gregory Corso. Nearby. My mother is far away as can be and always as close as my heart is to me. And um, so the poem, book about my dad, I wish my father begins with my parents separation because my mother died and my father still lived though I really thought he would die within minutes. Um, my parents were married for 63 years but he um, survived her by five years. So the book begins with their separation and ends with their um, reuniting in the world to come. So I'll just read a, a few short poems from here. Oh, and, and this book, um, the form is very different. The title does double duty. It also works as the first line of the poem. And then it's followed, the poem is all in tercets or three line stanzas. And they're much more narrative. When my father wakes up, on that first sweltering night of that first scalding summer, soaked in sweat like my mother when she suffered those terrible hot flashes 40 years ago. He stumbles out of bed and lumbers to the archaic air conditioner, fumbling for the right button to bring it back to life with a wheeze and a groan and a thump. Next, he shuffles across the faded carpet, slides between the worn sheets and lifts the torn blanket to cover my mother, who will surely go grow stiff from the frigid air blowing between them as she had for more than 60 years. Who could blame him for forgetting she had left him and was now slumbering on the other side of town, wrapped in a shroud beneath the stony, stubborn ground? How he missed her old, cold shoulder. And this is a true story. Do you think your father would take me to the theater? A woman pulls me aside, her pointed red nails digging into the doughy flesh of my bare upper arm. It is a hot August afternoon, made hotter still by the heat of the oven, which I had just opened to take out a pan of kugel a neighbor brought by and needed to be warmed. How did I wind up alone in this kitchen with this woman who does not look unlike my mother? styled and stiff thinning brown hair dried out from too many years of dying, lipstick two shades too dark, forehead lined like notebook paper, hope springing eternal in her made up myopic eyes. 
I drop the metal pan of food on the counter with a clatter, open a drawer near the sink and lift my mother's gleaming kitchen knife. What is this woman's name? Edna, Edith, Estelle, Esther, a woman my mother used to play canasta with and never particularly liked. She cheats, my mother told me on a scorching afternoon not that long ago. She picks out all the cashews in the bridge mix and she has eyes for your father. I cut the kugel into even sharp edged squares, missing my even sharp edged mother who would curl her lip and shoot me a silent, I told you so, look to hear Esther ask me if my father would take her to the theater the very afternoon after the morning of my mother's funeral. And then this happened. It was not a stroke of genius. It was not a stroke of luck. It was a stroke of misfortune that befell my father, leaving him crumpled at the foot of the driveway next to the garbage, waiting all morning to be picked up. And then this is the last poem in the book. My mother is at the bridge table with Loretta, Gert, and Pearl when my father finds his way to heaven. Sit down, dear, she says, patting the seat beside her and barely looking up from the hand she's been dealt. The game is almost through. But my father is too overcome to sit. He stands and stares at his beloved, free of wheelchair and oxygen tank, happily puffing away on a Chesterfield King, held between two perfectly manicured fingers, sipping a cup of instant Maxwell House, leaving a bright red lip print on the white china cup. Her hair, the lovely chestnut brown it was the day they met. Her face, free of worry lines, the diamond pendant he bought her on their first trip to Europe glittering against her ivory throat. She looks like the star of an old black and white movie who would never give him the time of day, but somehow spent, 20, spent 63 years by his side. I missed you, my father tells my mother, leaning down to kiss her offered cheek. Of course you did, says my mother, who always knows everything. She plays her cards right, and after Loretta and Pearl and Gert fold, she stands to let my father take her in his arms, and in their heavenly bodies, they dance. Thank you. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Um, those were all so, so evocative, and I'm, I'm struck by the fact that all of you are, all three of you are writing about history, writing about memory, writing about grief. Um, and I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about sort of how, I mean, I, I'm a historian, so I, I see history in many things, um, but I'd be interested to, to, to hear a little bit about how you see poetry, your poetry navigating those, um, those themes. Go ahead, Sharon. I, you want me to I, take this first, Leslie? Okay. I can see you have um, a thought. <laughs> uh, I always have lots of thoughts. Um, I, I think that, you know, poets often are speaking to histories, whether personal or public. Um, and those are not necessarily divorced from one another because our lives are always playing out individually and as families across a backdrop of history. And so, you know, in my own life, the, the, the fact of my migration from Jamaica, my mother's migration from Venezuela to Jamaica, those were orchestrated by larger forces of history that came to bear on our family's narrative and story. So that's one comment I'd make. In terms of, um, Judith, you're, you're a historian. What I'd say is the difference in the most recent book, No Ruin Stone, I did loads of research. I went to historical archives. This book is dealing with an alternate account of history. It is a book of poems, but that traces a story of what could have happened if the 18th century Scottish poet, Robert Burns, had in fact migrated to Jamaica to work on a slave plantation. This came very, very close to happening. So the book tells an alternate account of the Burns that goes and then his descendants. It's a story of colon colonization, of history of Jamaica, Scotland, um, of race, passing, all kinds of narratives. But the fact is that it's not archival history in the same way, because it leaves off where the archives end. It is an act of imagination. Um, and so those are just some various thoughts I have 
um, as a poet who works very much with personal and public histories alike. I, I was struck by the line in one of the poems you read about the, the dead uh, demanding accounting. And I was wondering if you were, if you feel that pull strongly in your, in your work. Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, I feel as if the voice that I've been given a vantage point to have is one that the, the various peoples that I'm from would not always have, have survived to be able to write this story. Um, and in my own family, I have loss of my father when I was a child, but this lot, these are layered losses that come out of my various, and I say various ancestries um, that I am very indebted to. I'm aware that I carry that. And I often feel as a poet, I'm speaking for the dead or to the dead. And Leslie, you do this so much in your books. I mean, these beautiful memorializing, eulogizing, elegies, like all of those forms that we use to contain grief, but that capture the lives of your parents. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful, these last two paired books I'm thinking of. Well, I definitely feel as a poet and someone who has the privilege of a, of a voice, a published poet, that it's my responsibility to give voice to the voiceless. So um, when, Judith, when you asked that question, I immediately thought of a book you had mentioned in my introduction, October Morning, a song for Matthew Shepard, which tells the story of Matthew Shepard's murder in a cycle of 68 poems um, through many voices, including Matt's voice, but also the, the fence that he was tied to, the truck he was kidnapped in, real and imagined people. Um, so, you know, I think I would, I would consider that, as I consider most of my poems, really poetry of witness. And I feel th that as um, a poet with a voice that people listen to, um, that that's, that's my job really is to, to shine light on that. And in terms of, of the two books that I read from today, you know, that of course is my own personal history, but like um, Shara pointed out, of course, it ties to a larger history. Um, all my grandparents were immigrants fleeing pogroms. And so my parents grew up very poor and that of course colored their lives, even though my dad was a very successful attorney, which was very hard won. He was a self-made man for sure. Um, but that colored everything. And they, they certainly always carried that um, poverty mentality with them. And also, you know, their feelings about, about being Jewish and who you can trust and who you couldn't trust. And they of course lost extended family in Europe because not all of my ancestors came over here. And, you know, so that colored my whole childhood. Right. And, and the, the, the um, you know, I love the way that you're particularly in, in these books about your parents, you know, they're so particular to your experiences and their experiences and who they were. And yet it feels like they, I mean, they very much come alive and speak to, I think, a lot of dynamics that people have, even if their family, their specific family dynamics may have been different or there's specific, specific family cases, you know, may have been different, but there are certain dynamics of family that I think come to life in such a beautiful way. Um, and that feel, even as they're very much soaked in grief, also feel so alive. So you, you uh, evoke their presence in such a powerful way. Well, it helps me, you know, because I miss them so much and writing the books helped, of course, but reading from the books also helps me because I, I didn't anticipate this, but when I ended each book in turn, the, all this grief welled up because writing the books kept them close to me and then they were gone again, right. you know? Mm -hmm. So reading brings them alive again, which is kind of nice. Right, I was thinking that there was a resurrection quality. I mean, especially in that last poem where you're imagining them together, but um, but bringing back those moments. Um, you, you've each written these longer narrative series of, po mm -hmm. of poems. And I'm curious how you, um, you know that not all poets write in that way, and I think it. It. Um, I. I'm curious how you approach that kind of writing, and whether it is. You know, a, I know, Leslie, you you use different forms in some of the poems, but but they are of a piece. Um, and I know that Shara also, your as you said, your book is, uh, your forthcoming book is is imagining a whole story. So how do you? Mm -hmm think about the individual poems and the series and the and creating a narrative arc in those projects. Leslie, I feel like you have a lot longer history working in this vein. This is a recent uh, development for me. So I can, I'll say a bit if you want, and then I think you, well, you'll have way more examples to add. Um, I'm very much a, a poet who's interested in the lyric mode and the dramatic mode. 
And so I asked those modes of poetry, this is the nerdy poet part of this here. I asked those modes, the lyric, the mode of song, of emotion distilled, and the dramatic monologue, the mode of voice and character. I asked those to tell a story across a whole book that is a novelistic story. This, this question that prompted this book is so much better treated by novelists. Um, what would have happened if Robert Burns had gone to Jamaica and worked on a slave plantation? This 18th century Scottish poet, well known whether people know it or not, because every year at New Year's Eve, we sing Old Lang Syne. So his work has survived and he's really thought of highly, not just in Scotland, but around the world. Um, this is the stuff novelists handle. I'm not a novelist, so I had to get poetry to do it. And I think I built it very differently than anything else I've written, but as, as it came down to it, there are two voices that I settled on primarily, Burns and his granddaughter, who's the product of an enslaved African woman and another Scottish man on the plantation who's the owner. And she is a white looking black woman passing for white in Scotland. So I constructed these characters as a way to use poetry to tell the story um, in a sequence of lyric dramatic monologues. Um, so that's the most specific answer I can give because I don't normally work like this, Judith. And Leslie knows this, I, I work much more from poem by poem and then I collect them. At the end, because I just keep writing the same poem over and over again, it seems like the whole book is constructed like that. But this is truly the first time on the front end. I had that kind of forethought and had to work backwards, if you would, into the music of the poem and the voice to find it in the story. Hmm. Do you think you'll work that way again? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I always think, and I know this is a joke to say after six books, I think every time I write a book and I finish it, well, done with poetry now, glad I'm finished. You know, so I don't know what to say. We'll be, I'll, I'm almost you know, 49 this year, so I'll be a liar if I keep saying this. But I really do feel at the end of each project and book, I'm, I've done what I can now. And I'm sure something else will take over and that will change my mind, but I hope not like this. No, this, was, this was exhausting work to write, to also to write about slavery, quite frankly, uh, was very difficult. So I, uh, I'm glad I did this. It called to me and I couldn't not write it. That's my definition for most things. If I can't not write it, then I will. But um, I hope for something else to come. Well, first of all, I'm so happy, Shara, that you wrote this book. It's so important and I urge everybody on the call to get it. When is it coming out? It will be out this summer. Okay, um, so. Yeah. And so uh, soon. It's very soon. Yep, and thank you, Leslie. Thank you. So, you know, when a, when a poet or any artist takes such a creative leap, it's just so thrilling because it's a whole new thing. And, you know, I tell this to my students, you know, when they started with me, you don't need me to teach you how to write what you've already written what you know how to write. So to, to try something new takes a lot of courage. So that is a wonderful thing. Um, writing a book length series of poems that contains a narrative arc is my absolutely favorite thing to do. So the first time I did it was I think in 1997, I wrote a book called Still Life with Buddy, um, which was about a friend of mine named Gerard Rizzo who died of AIDS. And it's actually, the book is about the passionate friendship of Buddy and a lesbian. So it's very uh, thinly disguised autobiography. So, you know, I started writing that book and I didn't know I was going to write 50 poems. I wrote one, then I wrote two, then I wrote five, then I wrote 10. And I thought, oh my God, can I keep going? And I challenged myself to write 50. And when I did it, I felt, I felt such a sense of accomplishment. And I also write fiction, as um, you may know, I wrote um, my best known um, piece of fiction is a short story called Letter to Harvey Milk, uh, which became a musical recently, which is quite exciting. Um, so, you know, it, it, it really challenges me, my poetic chops, my fiction writing chops, and to bring that all together. And I really think of both these books and my book, October Morning, as one poem really. And I think of um, the mamas and the papas. Do you remember the mamas and the papas? Um, so they were four voices that blended together beautifully. And they would talk about the fifth voice, right, which is the combination of their voices together. And so if I have a book of 50 poems, I think very carefully about the 51st poem, which is the culmination of all of the poems and how they work together. Um, and sometimes, um, 
you know, actually like my book, October Morning, um, I published that as a book for teens, though it, it has reached a wide audience in adults. Um, but the feedback I got from adult presses was, this is absolutely gorgeous, but each poem separately doesn't hold up on its own. Like we couldn't publish this in a journal because it needs all, everything surrounding it. And so I didn't agree with that particularly, but um, I understand that. And once in a while, when you write a book like this, you have to write a poem, I wouldn't exactly call it filler, but a poem that you need to bridge from one to another because you're telling a story in a different way than a non-themed poetry collection. So a lot does go into it. Um, mm -hmm. Shara's hoping she never does this again. I'm actually hoping that I do because I just I just love doing it. But I also, Shara, want to tell you that after every project, I feel like I'm done. I, I I've you know written everything I have to say, and you know, and I'm miserable between projects. I'm terrible to live with. Um, it's you know, I just think well, I'll Mary. never get an idea again. So, so I understand what that's like. And no one has any sympathy. They're like, you've written so many books. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Each time I end a book, the feeling is absolutely true and real and terrifying that I'll never write something else. It helps that you write in multiple genres. And I don't write in nearly the number, uh, and I'm ne not nearly as prolific as you are, but I write personal essay as well. And I feel as if there's such different modes that when one isn't really coming, you, you, I'm sure it's the same for you, Leslie, with all of your different um, genres that you're working in, you can turn to a different genre. Well, I'm glad you mentioned your essays because they're so beautiful. Um, when I don't know what to do, I always turn to poetry. And um, some t reading poetry, of course, helps. But also, as you heard, I write imitations sometimes. Some never see the light of day, but it's just to get that pen moving. And then something else hopefully will, will materialize. You, Shara, I'm glad you mentioned that that bit about the fact that each of you writes in, in some different forms. And mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you feel that the forms speak to one another. Like, do you think of the, the, the works as very separate or do you think of them as, you know, sort of as Leslie, Leslie, you're saying all the poems in a collection, a narrative collection come together to form one poem. Do you think of your writing across genres that way as well? Um, I can say that, you know, absolutely there's a connection for me. Um, I work a lot with autobiographical and historical materials and memory. And those are differently directed depending on if it's a poem or an essay. But the raw materials of the lived existence are the same. And they're, um, it's interesting to me to think of the discursivity of the essays, the big difference in my ear. So as I said, I'm a poet who loves voice and who loves music. And as an essayist, I think I have those qualities there just because it's what attracts me to language as a writer, but I have the space to actually develop thought and to extend argument and other kinds of pleasures that I feel the essay is more readily going to give me the canvas for. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so glad to hear you talk about language. It's amazing to me how many writers don't actually talk about language. Mm -hmm. You know, especially fiction writers, we talk about story, we talk about plot, character, setting, but language is really the, the common thread. Mm -hmm. um, when my mom died, I was surprised that I started writing personal essays, which I've written before, but it's, it's not, you know, my main genre really is poetry. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really what demanded to be written. And actually, someone told me that she loved my essays more than my poetry. I didn't really know how I felt about that. But um, I wrote this one essay. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it was about cleaning out my mother's clothes closet, which my father would not let me touch for for four years. Mm. And then I wrote a poem about that same experience in the book about my dad. So that was interesting to use the same material for two different forms and to see how they spoke to each other. Mm. I want to say something about that, Leslie, because I, you know the, the essay that I published last year through A Glass Darkly, which is the culmination of a life of thinking about race, identity, um, things I've written about as a poet for books and books. And it had, it garnered the same response. And I have a reason for that. I think that um, essays invite the reader in differently. So with poetry, like I was listening to your poems tonight thinking they're so musical, they're so beautiful. And the ear is so attracted. You're such a formalist, you're a beautiful formalist poet. So the ear is attracted to the music and the feeling and the emotion. 
but with the essay, because there is this one person speaking to you know, our experience so acutely, I think it invites the reader to participate in a different way and to share their responses. So when I would get tons of feedback on this essay, you know, I was shocked at the disclosures that people felt they could tell me about themselves now. Mm. It was so um, honestly moving to me, honestly. Like I've put out my story that I'm so anxious about writing about. Where will this connect to anyone who's not got this particular weird DNA and <laughs> besides me and my sisters, you know? And to receive back, like I'm not exactly like you, but here's how this connected. I just think that was a gift. And so I think, I didn't take it badly. I mean, I, I don't know what to say to your friend saying it's better. I don't think it's better. I think it's different. I think it invites participation differently, you know? Well, you know, that is very interesting because when I read that essay, I was reminded of this quote. I don't remember who said it. I might've been, oh, I don't know. Uh, but the it's I think about it all the time that you should be able to it might have been Stanley Kunitz. You should, mm -hmm. should be able to walk around the block between every line of poetry. Mm -hmm. And I felt that way about your essay, Shara, because, uh, you know, and I, everybody should read this essay. It's so intelligent and so provocative. And I had to really stop and think. You know, it gave me so much to think about. And then I would continue. And I don't usually do that with poetry. You know, I really just want to read the poetry and not interrupt the flow of language. But with an essay, I will pause and maybe even take some notes and, and really think about it. So, um, you know, I think you accomplished the same thing, but in such a different way with that essay and, and with your poems. Thank you. And this conversation, you know, thinking about what we explicate in different ways and sort of how we bring our autobiographies to our writing um, anticipated another question I wanted to ask you, which is this question of um, how your identity shapes your poetry, how your poetry shapes your identity, perhaps, um, you know, sort of how, what you're bringing of yourself uh, into this work as women, as Jews, as whatever other identities you, you feel you are, um, refracting through the form of poetry? Well, for me, um, my identity, especially as a Jewish woman, influences my language because I grew up um, with my grandmother lived across the street and I was at her house as much as I was at my own home. And so her first language was Yiddish. And so even when she was 99 years old, she would say, I don't speak good English. So she never felt like she mastered it, the English language though she was here for 89 of those 99 years. And so when um, I hear her voice in my head and I hear my parents' uh, voice in my head, which you know they were one, one removed, they grew up in Yiddish speaking households, but it's not their native language. And then I'm even further removed, but I have um, that vernacular in my, in my heart and in my brain. In fact, Grace Paley is the one I studied with her and she encouraged me. She said, you know, don't worry if it's not correct English, write the language of your soul. So, so my identity as a, as a Jew and as a granddaughter of immigrants really influences the way I write. And I think about that all the time. This is such a, this is a hard question for me to be brief on. So I'm glad I'm going to try to follow Leslie's lead. And I gave a forewarning to this Judith. The easiest way for me to explain this is that in my ancestry and my going back to my grandparents, I have four continents, um, approximately, you know, over 25 countries represented in my ancestry. And um, in terms of religion, I'm Jewish. I was raised Rastafarian. So that's a different faith system. And I come by Judaism ancestrally and as a convert as an adult. So all of that, four continents, four world religions, you know, um, different languages that were my ancestral history from my mother's language being Spanish. That is not my mother tongue. My mother tongue is English. I'm born in Jamaica, migrate to the US. I say all those things because it's layered and complex. Um, my relationship to all of those pieces, I feel like I joke about this all the while. I, I feel everything I say, I have to have like an asterisk. You know, so very much I'm a Jewish woman. Oh, let me explain this part of how, what that means, since I'm not going to probably fulfill 
your imagination of what that is, right? When people see my name, um, and I saw a comment earlier about my first name, so I'll just respond to the person who shares my, my first name, that my parents really didn't know that it was Hebrew. I'm quite sure that in just the great luck of the universe, my name in Hebrew means a woman is singing. The root song, the root for Shira, as many of you know, is the same, poetry and song, sing. So I feel my parents gifted me this identity without knowing it. I mean, that's a very sort of mystical way of thinking about it. It's also Swahili um, and it means a bright shining star. So I love that my parents gave me this name that refracts these different aspects of my identity that I feel have been with me my whole life. The branch of Rastafarians I was raised as, the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, the connections between my Jewish identity and my Rasta identity are so for me overlapping. So that's like the best I can do in a short space of time to answer this, um, but it's a great question. Identity, it's, it's the question. Who are we wherever we find ourselves? Right, and we're probably, whatever form we work in, we are all working through that all the time. And But I'm, it makes me think that, you know, just hearing a little bit about um, how you answer that question, Shara, makes me feel like, I'm sure there are more books for you, even if you don't feel it in this moment. <laughs> saying that. Um, I want to leave some time for you to read again, um, but also wanted to just, you know, think, I wanted to ask, yeah, and, and certainly people, people should be putting their questions in the chat. Um, we haven't had so many questions, mostly just appreciations. Um, but if you have questions, please add them into the chat. Um, <laughs> I, you know, we're speaking a year into a pandemic and a time of also racial reckoning and um, just a, a year of a lot of upheaval and crisis. And, you know, I'm curious what it's been like for you both as writers this year, you know, how how the experience of living on, in the conditions we've been living under has um, affected your writing, if it has, mm -hmm. you know, what what you've, um, how, how you feel you've been shaped by by the world in this moment um, in your writing lives? Well, very early on, sure. very early on, I decided that um, this was a great opportunity to use poetry to bring community together. So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I wasn't writing so much as much as I was organizing through poetry. So what I did was I decided that um, my local poetry community, which is pretty vast, the Pioneer Valley, we needed a forum. So um, I approached um, Straw Dog Writers Guild and I had a proposal for them that um, we should post a poem a day by local poets. Yeah. Um, so um, I spent more time reading other people and we posted about, we did it for about five months, I think, a poem a day. And so I spent more time reading other people's poetry, which was very comforting actually. Um, and then, after that, that sort of kind of um, pushed me along to, to get back to my own writing. And so I, I did write um, some poems directly about what was happening. Um, there's a wonderful website called New Verse News, which um, is poets response to current events. And I had some poems up there. Um, and there were days that I just couldn't write. There was just too much going on. It was just the world was too intense. You know, I was like everybody else, full of grief and fear and just trying to hold it together. Um, so connecting with my poetry community really, really helped and um, was, was a great way to, to get me through. That so very reflects our experience here at JWA too. We started the quarantine book talks I think about five days after we closed the office, just because we were like, here's an opportunity. People are in their homes. Let's bring them together online. And I never would have thought we'd be continuing them on a weekly basis more than a year later and, and have such an audience for them. But I think it's um, people have felt the need to come together as a community around art and creativity at a time when we have felt like those things feel both more essential than ever and also elusive in many ways. I think, you know, the our... For many of us, our creative fires are um, tamped down a little bit. <laughs> and so to be able to um, have our fires lit by other people or, or find comfort and connection and 
sustenance and resilience and in those connections and in other people's um, creative sharing has been an incredible gift of this time. I didn't mean to cut you off, Shara. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no, no. That's beautiful what you said. And Leslie, you too. I can add to it and echo it mainly by saying that I don't feel the need to always be writing as a poet or as a writer. So um, I also am a poet who benefits from long periods of reflection. I tend to write about the past and about um, in the eight, I was living in the 18th century to write this book for the last, you know, five years. Um, but that's because I think I always hear in the present, the past is why. So when I'm listening to, um, you know, this whole past year, not about COVID, but about all of the racial reckoning you refer to, Judith, I kept thinking about Cloud Mackay's poem written in 1919, If We Must Die. It's a sonnet about the, the lynchings of, rampant lynchings of Black men in 1919 in the United States. And it's written 100 years ago. And yet it speaks to the present, which is both a sad commentary um, on the present, as well as just the fact that the, the struggle for freedom and for you know um, survival on this planet has always been going on. And so I love history because it reminds you, like in your own piercing, you know, tyranny of the self, I call it, the narcissism, right? This is just happening to me. I look for the relief of it, right? So as much as I'm interested and invested in the invest, you know, self, I really love the idea that you can read in poetry these experiences that are so far different from yours and yet speak to you so profoundly. So, um, you know, I haven't written a poem about COVID. I've been, I've been living through it. I have teenagers. I am working. I teach. Um, I've been really thinking the most important thing for me right now is to show up for the people who are in more dire straits than I am. I have to be the grown up in the room. You know, I have to be there for my students and my kids. So there will be a point, I'm sure, where I'll have more erudite things to say, hopefully, about what this all meant. But, um, you know, not yet for me anyway. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that from a lot of people that it's been hard. It's been hard to write. I certainly have found that in this time. Um, let's, let's bring some more poetry back uh, into the room. Um, which one of you would like to go first? Do you have a preference? Well, I'll jump in because it kind of ties into what we were just saying. Um, mm -hmm. So unlike um, many poets, I just jumped right in to write about the pandemic. Um, and so very often I write um, modeled on Wallace Stevens' 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. Mm -hmm. So I wrote 13 Ways of Looking at Life Before the Virus. Mm -hmm. So when, when in doubt, I, I turn to this form and something always gets pulled out of me. And th this is like a writing teacher's favorite exercise, right, Char? I'm sure you've, you have used this with your students. So um, this is called 13 Ways of Looking at Life Before the Virus. One. I remember shaking hands, damp sweaty hands and dry scratchy hands, bone crushing handshakes and dead fish handshakes, two handed handshakes, my hands sandwiched between a pair of big beefy palms. I remember hairy hands and freckled hands, young smooth hands and old wrinkled hands, red polished fingernails and bitten jagged fingernails, stained hands of hairdressers who had spent all day dying, dirty hands of gardeners who dug down deep into the good earth. Two, thousands of years ago, a man stuck out his right hand to show a stranger he had no weapon. The stranger took his hand and shook it to make sure he had nothing up his sleeve. And that is how it began. Three, I remember sharing a bucket of greasy popcorn with a boy at the movies, though I no longer remember the boy or the movies, the thrill of our hands accidentally on purpose brushing each other in the dark. Four, I remember my best girlfriend and me facing each other to play a hand clapping game shrieking, Miss Mary Mac, 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 and the loud satisfying smack as our four palms slapped. Five, I remember high fives and how we'd laugh when we missed and then do a do over. Six, I remember the elegant turn of shiny brass doorknobs cool to the touch. Seven, I remember my mother's hands tied to the railings of her hospital bed and how I untied them when the nurse wasn't looking and held them in my lap. 
eight. I remember holding my father's hand, how the big college ring he wore rubbed against my birthstone ring and irritated my fourth finger, but I never pulled away. Nine, I remember the joy of offering my index finger to a new baby who wrapped it in her fist as we gazed at each other in wonder. 10, I remember tapping a stranger on the shoulder and saying, your tag is showing, do you mind if I tuck it in? She didn't mind, I tucked it in. 11, I remember salad bars and hot bars. I remember saying, want a bite? And offering a forkful of food from my plate. I remember asking, can I have a sip? And placing my lips on the edge of your cold, frosty glass. 12, I remember passing around the kiddush cup each of us taking a small sip of wine. I remember passing around the challah, each of us ripping off a big yeasty hunk. I remember picking up a serving spoon someone had just put down without giving it a second thought. 13, I remember sitting with a mourner at a funeral, not saying a word, simply taking her hand. So beautiful. Thank you, Leslie. And may we have those those moments of touch again soon. I hope so. And Leslie, I'm really grateful for you and the numerous poets, I think, who have been writing gorgeous poems about this moment. I was mostly speaking to my own quirkiness as a poet who I really think this comes out of my earliest love of poetry, which is the, you know, no, no shocker, I've gone back to Robert Burns. Um, before I ever imagined being a poet, it, you know, I was in love with Keats when I was, you know, 17. Um, his half in love with Eastful Death, you know. So I, I think that that comes out of this notion that for me, after a clearing is when I'm able to see something, mm. right? And so, um, but I think what's great, and I hope people take from that this, and if Joy were here, she would have given yet another perspective is as many poets as there are, there are ways to be a poet, to write poetry. Um, and one of mine, and this echoes what Liz Leah said is, I love reading other poets and I love to read poetry by other people to people. So I thank Judith for giving me an opportunity, not only to share something of mine and to listen to and be in this conversation with Leslie and Joy, but to get to read a, book, a poem by Shimona Duff. This is one of my favorite books I've read in the last year or two. I'm holding it up to see the show and tell like Leah did. Uh, it's translated from the Hebrew by Yael Segalovitz. And it is a book length sequence. Um, it is a, an entire poem of mourning and it is the poem of grief for his, for his sister's death. So I can't read all of it to you, but I hope by reading a part of it, I will encourage you to go and get this book by Shimona Daff. It's just numbered too. At night, the destroyers are given permission. The flaming vault of heavens, merciless, downcast, Kislev, a black conflagration is within him. The remaining sisters sit and sew the shreds of the rent body. One threads a string, the other strikes the needle. The third screams, oh no, the finger, it is pricked. Blinders of the moons, a sketch in silver, fine as cracked skin and the fire of the crimson drop is glowing. Blood moves in the world, yet suffices not for one being to be saved. And blood spills, how to put it, fountains and depths spring out of valleys and hills. Thank you so much to both of you for being with us tonight, for sharing of yourselves. Um, I've been thinking all week, actually, as I was preparing for this about uh, one of my favorite essays by Audre Lorde, Poetry is Not a Luxury. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about um, the role of poetry in our lives, especially in these moments where, um, these moments of intensity and urgency. So uh, I wanna thank you for offering us the, the vital necessity of poetry tonight. Um, I encourage everyone to buy your books. The links are in the chat. Um, I hope people will delve more deeply into your work. Um, this is an invitation to, 
to swim in the deep and vast sea of poetry. Um, I want to thank everyone who is with us tonight for just uh, being together and being a receptive uh, community here. Um, I hope you'll all join us next week, same time, same place, for a conversation with Brandy Colbert, the author of Little and Lion. Um, and in the meantime, I encourage you to check out the many, many resources we have in our digital archive at jwa.org. We have so much material for you to discover, help you gain insight about the diversity of the Jewish story. If you enjoyed our conversation here tonight, which I know you all did, um, you might want to check out our podcast series on creativity during the pandemic, especially the episode with the poet Sabrina Ora Mark, um, or our quarantine book talk from last spring with the poet Rachel Zucker. Again, thank you so much to Leslia and to Shara and to Joy. It was wonderful to be with you all tonight. Until next time, be well, be safe, and have a lovely evening. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.